Right, well, thanks very much, Gordon. Um, the story of how Shockley recruited you to, to go to work for him is well told, so, so let me jump straight into when you're at Shockley Labs. What specifically were you doing in those first few months? Well, when I got to Shockley Labs, I didn't know anything about semiconductors, really. And, uh, of course, that was very early in the history of the industry. There wasn't an awful lot known when you come right down to it. Uh, I was a physical chemist by training. Uh, Shockley knew chemists, did some good things for him at Bell Labs, so thought he needed one out here. Uh, my job turned out to be to set up some of the diffusion technology and uh, do experiments to figure out how to make diffuse silicon devices. It was really a learning experience. Uh, uh, what we were doing was different than what had been tried before. We had to repeat some of the Bell Labs experiments and then uh, move on from there. Uh, it was really uh, interesting work to do uh, very exploratory in nature. Okay. And where did you get the equipment and the materials to, to do this? Uh, the equipment and materials generally weren't available. The stuff we bought for equipment was standard laboratory kinds of things. Laboratory furnaces, generally heated by glow bars. You had to get up to high temperatures, you know, 1200, 1250 degrees centigrade in order to do the silicon processing we wanted. And not many furnaces were capable of operating those temperature ranges. But the standard laboratory equipment that you could buy uh, didn't have flat temperature zones, for example. Uh, typically, these were tube furnaces that were big enough to put a small piece of silicon in. Uh, materials were a problem. In fact, one of Shockley's first major projects there uh, was a new way of growing silicon. Uh, that would avoid the contamination that generally came out of the crucible. Uh, that was a big project, although it never ended up quite being functional. Uh, other equipment, uh, we could buy standard uh, bell jar evaporators, for example, which were useful for putting down thin films. But we had to build a lot of ourselves. I remember building a... a water system that involves several five-gallon jars of water connected together so you could get distilled water to rinse the wafers with. It was uh, building a, you know, laboratory-scale equipment from what you could buy out of the typical laboratory supply houses. Okay. I've also read that uh, the jungles for the diffusion furnace, they were all blown by you, the glass blowing. Well, that was one of my job. In my uh, education and subsequent work, I'd done a lot of uh, technical glass blowing, uh, making the old glass jungles and let you manipulate gases and uh, purify materials. Uh, so I took the same technology and used it for uh, the controls over the uh, diffusion furnaces. Initially, quite simple things, and then they became increasingly complicated as we figured more things we wanted to do. Okay. Now, because you were breaking new ground, I'm sure you know a lot of mistakes were made. Any stories about things that went drastically wrong? I, we were doing new things, and some of us succeeded in doing some pretty dumb things. Uh, we had one engineer uh, who uh, sealed some silicon and some arsenic into a quartz capsule and shoved it into the furnace. He forgot to look up the vapor pressure of arsenic, and uh, the tube exploded, and arsenic vapors went all around the laboratory. Uh, that was a case of fairly uh, poor judgment. But uh, you know, we had uh, some accidental successes. Uh, one problem we were having was making uh, silicon junctions that had what we called hard breakdowns. They really showed the kind of characteristic you wanted in a diode. And uh, I was diffusing gallium into silicon uh, and controlling the gallium concentration by uh, water vapor and hydrogen to uh, determine how much gallium oxide evaporated. And 
uh, one time I ran out of water, and the net result was a lot more gallium evaporated. It formed puddles on the silicon wafer. The wafer came out just looking terrible. Those were the hardest junctions we ever made. In retrospect, it turned out that the liquid gallium metal gettered the impurities that were in the silicon, causing the diodes to be bad in the first place. And those were actually the diodes that were used by uh, Shockley, Sa, and Noyce in their study on uh, space charge recombination, because they were ones that behaved theoretically the way the diodes should. Okay. And there was also the story about you melting some... Um some expensive material, what, what was it? Uh... Well, one of the furnaces uh, that I tried to design after deciding we needed a long flat zone, uh, I used uh, platinum winding. I ordered a significant amount of platinum wire since the melting point of platinum was above where we had to be. I put double windings on the ends to compensate for the heat losses and actually got a fairly good flat zone in the furnace. Unfortunately, the furnace only lasted for about two weeks before the element burned out. It turns out that while platinum doesn't melt at these temperatures, somehow or other it sublimes. When we took the furnace apart, there were little crystals of platinum uh, away from where the wire had been, and we had to send it off to a recovery company to uh, salvage the several thousand dollars worth of platinum that were in the furnace. Now, did Bill Shockley get involved very much in, in what you were doing, you know, sort of looking over your shoulder? Or... Uh, uh, Shockley didn't get involved very much in what I was doing. Uh, you know, he was a physicist, I was a chemist, so he didn't think he had to know everything that I presumably was doing. Uh, he was uh, useful for uh, broad concepts. The one place he did get involved where we disagreed fairly strongly was when he wanted to change his objective from making a silicon transistor to making a four-layer diode. Uh, he was going from a general purpose device to one with, at best, very narrow applications, and one that required essentially the same technology. And uh, just from a technical point of view, did that really change the equipment and the... You know, no, that the... didn't change the equipment much. It probably simplified some things because it only required contacts on the top and the bottom. It didn't require anything to any interior layers. Uh, but uh, that was mainly a, a device assembly simplification. The processing was pretty much the same. We're using diffusions and evaporations of metal, that sort of thing. Um, just uh, looking back, how much progress do you think you made in, in the sort of the 15 or 18 months that you were there in, in perfecting the process? Was it you made leaps and bounds or it was uh, slow going? Uh, I don't think we moved the state of the art ahead very much. Uh, looking back at it, it was a, really a dirty facility. It was hardly more than a Quonset hut, uh, no air conditioning, uh, no clean room capability at all. The net result was we had a very difficult time making devices with good electrical characteristics. Uh, we learned a lot of things not to do. And uh, you know, when we went off and started Fairchild, uh, we could use that knowledge of what not to do to start off in a new direction with a much better idea where we wanted to go eventually. Okay. Well, just moving on to Fairchild, um, when I interviewed Jay Last a, a while back, he, he said he just thought it was amazing that you got this uh, transistor factory up from you know, an a empty factory to a production floor in like eight months. Could you just talk about your, how you saw that and, and you know, your perspective on the first f several months at Fairchild, the challenges? And well, uh, Fairchild uh, got started again with the idea of making a double diffuse silicon transistor. And we thought we knew the direction we wanted to go. We divided up the various uh, elements that uh, had to be in place among the, the senior staff there. 
and each set out to do it. I took on diffusion and metallization, for example. Uh, Jay and Bob Noyce took on uh, developing photolithography. Uh, I worked on some of the assembly technology. Sheldon Roberts worried about growing silicon crystals. Essentially, we divided up the job among the people who were used to doing the kind of equipment uh, preparation that were necessary. And we went out then to get the equipment we thought would be suitable for what we were tackling. We built furnaces uh, that uh, took advantage of uh, an element that was available from Sweden that uh, was capable of going to these high temperatures and not burning out in a couple of weeks. Uh, all of the equipment for the photolithography had to be developed from scratch. Photolithography had been used for printed circuit boards, but we wanted to really apply it to production silicon technology, and that required everything new. Uh, we had to develop the mask-making technology as well as the techniques for coating wafers with uh, the photoresist material and so forth. So it was an extensive amount of uh, new technology that we were bringing to bear on our first products. The uh, machine we made for making masks was one that was developed internally, uh, initially, uh, using uh, three lenses uh, for 16 millimeter movie cameras. And uh, it stepped three masks at a time uh, for the three different patterns. And by having them all tied together, any error in one was repeated in the other, so the mask would actually align with one another. Uh, were there any special challenges in, in procuring materials for transistor production? Uh, getting pure enough chemicals was always a problem. Uh, we frankly didn't know how pure we had to get them, so we got the best available and pushed the suppliers to continue to improve the purity. Uh, the silicon itself... Uh, initially, we thought we had to grow our own crystals, but uh, I guess Napic, who had been with us at Shockley, set up a company at that time to grow silicon crystals and supply them commercially. So while we made our own crystals in the very beginning, as soon as we could buy them on the outside, we abandoned that particular part of the business. And still on materials, did you ever work on anything like gallium arsenide during your time at Fairchild? Not during that time. Uh, later on, after Fairchild was well established in the silicon business, in the R&D lab we did work with gallium arsenide and looked at other materials. We did enough with gallium arsenide to convince ourselves it wasn't going to replace silicon generally. Okay. All right. Um, now there's also the story of, of Art Lash um, and I believe that you know you encouraged him to to go off and, and make the capillaries and then eventually yeah. he started his own company. Yeah, Art Lash uh, was my technician uh, for a good part of the time there. Uh, he helped me build the furnaces and then when we developed the gold ball bonding technology where a, a small gold wire was put through a glass capillary that could be used to squish it onto the uh, make the contacts. Uh, we had a problem that the capillaries kept getting plugged, so we had to have a significant supply of these. Uh, Art became uh, very good at making these things, so he was encouraged by our production people, and Gene Kleiner in particular, who was in charge of that, uh, essentially to moonlight and make glass capillaries on the outside and deliver them to us. Well, that business grew... And Art next uh, upgraded the design of the furnaces we'd built at Fairchild and started supplying furnaces also from his company, Electroglass. And that was really the first company I know of that was specifically set up to deliver equipment to the semiconductor industry. And, and was there any, uh, I guess there were no IP issues back then. His furnace was based on your furnace, but you didn't particularly... Mind about that. It wasn't that much. The, the furnaces uh, we designed uh, used commercially available elements. Uh, 
you know, there was nothing that we thought especially patentable in them. Uh, and Art picked it up and uh, improved it. And as so often is the case in the semiconductor industry, uh, it wasn't long before the furnaces being supplied on the outside were better than the ones we were building internally. So uh, you started buying from Electroglass eventually? Yes, so we did, uh, and other people got into the furnace business also. Mm -hmm. But that's been repeated over and over again, that a company dedicated to supplying the equipment that has a, a broad market ends up doing a better job than an in-house equipment supply capability can. So when we set up Intel, we decided we'd do nothing on equipment internally. We'd work with the vendors, and even if this resulted in the technology we developed getting transferred to the rest of the industry, it would be the most effective way for us to continue to grow. Okay. Well, uh, let's move on to Intel. Uh, I'll, I'll get on to the supplier relationship later, but just first wanted to ask your very first fab at Intel, what were the challenges in, in getting that up and running and uh, working? Uh, at Intel, the challenge of the first fab was uh, just getting it done in a hurry. Uh, we set a, I believe it was four goals that uh, we had to accomplish before we could really make devices. And uh, set up a wager between the people who had to do it and the people who were watching to, to see if it could be done. And these were pretty aggressive. Uh, it required uh, getting these things done by the end of that first year. Now, we started really the beginning of August, and we wanted to get them done by the end of December. So... Uh, uh, it was really a challenge just to get it done. In fact, the, the last goal was actually achieved, I believe, on the 31st of December with a little fudging in order to make that happen. Okay. Do you remember the specific goals? Uh, one of them uh, was to make a stable MOS device, which requires getting everything purified and the like, and that was the last one that was accomplished. Uh, but it was accomplished by putting a barrier layer in rather than by cleaning things up so much that we could do it uh, directly. Uh, but uh, they involved uh, the usual things about being able to make good junctions and so forth. They were relatively trivial, but things that took a time to set up. Uh, and the challenge of going from essentially an empty building to being able to accomplish these things in uh, the span of August, September, October, November, December, just five months, was really a challenge. Uh, we gave each of the engineers a book of purchase orders, each of the engineers responsible for a particular area, not requisitions that had to go through a purchasing department or anything, but the engineer would talk to the salesman for the equipment handwrite the purchase order and hand it to them as soon as uh, the equipment was specified, just to get everything going in a hurry. It, it shocked the salesmen quite often. They didn't know what to do with this kind of a purchasing procedure, but it was very effective in a startup. Okay. And just as a follow-on to that, I, I've read in Leslie Berlin's book that Eugene Flath went to the Westcon show and basically was buying stuff off the floor that was kind of uh, the same thing. I'm sure that's the case. The Westcon show came at the right time of year uh, for us to do that. Uh, it was here locally, as I recall, and uh, we needed the equipment pretty badly. I think an evaporator came right off the floor. I don't remember what else, but uh, I know it, rather than have the company ship the equipment back to their factories, if we could get it shipped to Intel at that time, it helped us get started in a hurry. Okay. Now, uh, so in building that first fab at Intel, you could get all the equipment you know, off the shelf from outside? Was there anything you had to build? Uh, I don't remember us really having to build everything. We had to adapt a, f a few things. In particular, we had to adapt uh, an epitaxial reactor uh, to deposit polycrystalline silicon. We're trying to do the silicon gate MOS. 
but uh, the only things we would build would be a few relatively simple jigs and fixtures. We just tried to work with the equipment industry. Um, now you, you've talked about this a little bit before, but um, you know, companies like IBM and TI built their own equipment, and they were sort of were holdouts that they resisted buying from independent suppliers for a long time because they thought that was their competitive edge. But you were completely the opposite at Intel. But what was your thinking in terms of just not wanting to have any proprietary in-house equipment? Uh the thinking about our approach at Intel uh, resulted from some of the problems we got in Inner Fairchild. Uh, the typical situation being uh, we would build a first generation of equipment that would work. Uh, what we learned would be picked up by the equipment vendors and pretty soon the equipment available on the outside was better than the stuff we did internally. I mentioned earlier where this happened uh, on diffusion furnaces, probably the strongest example had to do with epitaxial reactors. Again, in the beginning, we had to build our own. Uh, there was no equipment industry to supply them. But uh, we built a couple of kludges that worked after a fashion. But the commercial machines turned out to be a lot better than what we were doing internally. So it wasn't long before we had to abandon our internal efforts and uh, adopt what was available on the outside. And we began to see this as a pattern, that uh, you just couldn't maintain uh, state-of-the-art equipment internally because you didn't have the, the customer base that needed something new all the time that let you keep improving things. You kind of got locked into a generation for a long period of time. You would have to make a big improvement, which was a lot harder to do. So uh, the equipment industry and the, the semiconductor processing industry uh, really were very complementary and increasingly uh, I think that split has been recognized by everybody. Okay. Now uh, in talking about working closely with suppliers, I believe you actually invested in applied materials. Oh, that's uh, right, I did. Uh, I was interested then at that time in uh, doing some venture capital kind of things, applied materials. Uh, looked like an interesting possibility. Uh, I guess I never expected we'd end up being their biggest customer. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, when Intel started doing much with applied materials, I sold my investment in it. I, it started to look more like a conflict of interest. Okay. So it, your investment wasn't so much to support an equipment company, but just a, a VC type. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, I was looking at it as a financial investment rather than as uh, something to help us get equipment later down the road. Okay. And then I, I also believe you're on the board of Micromask with Joe Ross. Uh, uh, that's right. I was on the board of Micromask uh, what was your motivation for quite a while. I, again, I went on it early. Uh, it was an opportunity to get on the board of a company and learn something about how somebody else worked. Uh, so it wasn't a supply, like helping to get masks for Intel. It wasn't kind of a well. Like it, that. that was a case where we were buying quite a bit of stuff from Micromask, hmm. and uh, I was interested in making sure that uh, we had a good supply. At that time, uh, Intel thought it could buy its masks on the outside. Also, we didn't have an internal mask making operation. Uh, as the industry developed and the mass demands became much greater than uh, they were in the beginning, uh, we just had to start doing it in-house. And about the same time Intel set up a significant mask-making operation in-house, uh, Micromask kind of disappeared. So uh, the timing worked out reasonably well. Now, um, were there any other suppliers that you worked really closely with in those first few years, you know, LAM or KLA or Tencor? Or we worked with a variety of them. Uh, uh, we certainly worked with LAM uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, my involvement got less and less in the details of these things, so my memory is increasingly fuzzy. But the idea was we'd work with the equipment vendors to get what we needed.
Uh, now let's just talk about the Japanese uh, equipment vendors. Do you have any recollection of when they sort of appeared on your radar screen and when you started buying from them? Oh, the, uh, the place they really appeared was in photolithography. Uh, the big steppers that uh, were coming out of Canon and Nikon. Uh, there wasn't a comparable piece of equipment in the U.S., and that was such a critical part of the entire process, we got very concerned about where it was coming from. Uh, we had a major program, in fact, with the Lichtenstein Company to make a, a stepper. Uh, very sophisticated, uh, but also very expensive, and the development went too slowly for them to really make an impact on the market. Uh, we ended up buying Japanese equipment because it was the best available, and there wasn't really an alternative source for that. And I, I guess that's still the case now with lithography equipment. Yeah. Except for ASML. Yeah, Euro okay, European. The, the European company is an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the concern, of course, was that the Japanese were going to expand from there and take over the entire equipment industry. And then we got concerned that we wouldn't have the access to it that we had with the you know, other suppliers. So that became increasingly our paranoia as the Japanese were making increasing inroads into the whole semiconductor industry. I understand that Bob Noyce lobbied in support of the lithography industry and there was a particular sale of a company, okay. uh, and he tried to stop that from being sold to Japan. Do you have any recollection? I know uh, Bob uh, worried about this a good deal, and I, I'm sure he lobbied to try to keep the, the U.S. ahead of something that he thought was pretty important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, to a significant extent, uh, that kind of thing was what... Uh, drove the industry toward the, the Semitech operation, uh, something where you know, we could do a lot of the equipment work in one place. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's the next question. Uh, Semitech and some equipment suppliers that I've talked to have said that before Semitech, they were frustrated because the device makers wouldn't share their, uh, you know, their future roadmaps with them. Therefore, they couldn't design equipment. But after Semitech, that changed. Did you see that wall between device and equipment companies in terms of not sharing roadmaps and so forth? Uh, I hope that wasn't the case with Intel. You know, we tried to make sure the equipment vendors were there when we needed the equipment. Uh, but uh, it was a complicated deal. Uh, the equipment vendors... Uh, had to match the schedules of the semiconductor suppliers. Uh, I remember giving a talk uh, at a semi-meeting once, uh, trying to explain this problem generally, that you know the bus leaves on a particular set of technology at a particular time. And if they're not in that first bunch of equipment, they lose that whole generation. Uh, they can come in six months later with a better machine, but it wouldn't be used by Intel. The process had already been developed with the equipment that was there. So they had to have the equipment ready to match our schedule of new technology, or they had to wait typically three years and uh, get on the next load. And uh, this was always a complicating feature because... Uh, it, it was a change in the way the industry was operating. Uh, we wouldn't always buy a better mousetrap. Uh, it would only be on occasions that we could uh, get one qualified for use in the next process. Okay. All right. I just wanted to move on to the, the wafer size transitions. And okay. IBM, you know, funded the 8-inch the eight or 200 millimeter, and I, I was, I'm told that Intel pretty much funded the 6-inch transition. Why did you feel that you had to do that? Uh, wafer size changes uh, turn out to be pretty tough. Uh, but the advantages after you've successfully moved to a larger wafer are pretty great. Uh, we were setting up a new plant 
that was the first one in Albuquerque, really, the first big one, and thought that six inch was the way we had to go. But it requires uh, debugging an entire generation of equipment to go to the next level. And uh, that was uh, quite expensive, and uh, we weren't ready to take it on again at the 8-inch, which was not much later in time. But uh, fortunately, other people did. Uh, we moved to the 8-inch and are now merrily doing 12-inch. Uh, I continually am amazed at how big the wafers have gotten. Uh, I don't believe that I was convinced we'd go beyond about six inches for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay? We don't need to change the tape. So, so you never considered uh, putting up the money for the, the 200 millimeter transition? You have wanted somebody else to do that? Yeah, we we were not ready to do it. Uh, it was probably something at that time where the memory manufacturers would benefit more than we would. Uh, yeah, we would have done it if nobody else had, but fortunately somebody else stepped up to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, just uh, another question that I came up with was about the silicon cycles. Uh, I mean, how, did, how did, you, did you have a strategy to survive those at Intel? The silicon yeah, cycles? Yeah, silicon cycles, the, the up well, and down. Uh, the thing you learn in this industry fairly early is it tends to have cycles. Uh, we certainly did develop a strategy. Uh, the philosophy was you never get well in the old products. You know, these cycles for the device suppliers were generally price-driven, not volume-driven. In fact, if you plot the volume of devices, you see very, very few dips and very mild ones. You plot the dollars and you see very wide fluctuations. Uh, cases, oh, I know one case, for example, it kind of etched in my mind where Intel's most profitable product price fell 90% in nine months. Uh, while the industry is good at decreasing costs, it, it can't follow that kind of a curve. Uh, so these cause fairly abrupt dislocations, but that price never comes back up. Uh, you only get the increased revenue by moving on to the next generation of products. So it's very important that you continue the R&D investment across the, the bottom of these cyclical recessions. You always have to have the new things coming out the other end. And this is something that uh, tends to be counterintuitive to people used to operating in other industries where you cut your costs, which means often cutting development of one thing or another during the recessionary periods and build them up again during the others. Here you can't do that. You have to keep developing the new stuff in fact, you even have to accelerate the development of the new stuff across these negative periods. Uh, is there any opportunity to work with equipment suppliers during those down periods? To, you know, to, cause they're pretty There's an opportunity to work with them. Uh, the problem is that those are periods when you're typically not putting in new capacity, at least not in any quantity. You're developing new products, you're developing new technology. Uh, so the equipment supplier suffers even worse than the uh, device manufacturer. Uh, their order book often turns negative during that time as people start canceling orders faster than the new ones are coming in. Uh, it makes, uh, it, it reflects the problems that the semiconductor device manufacturers have much more strongly than the equipment manufacturers. And it can even be worse than that on some of the material suppliers. If you uh, look at uh, something that includes the desire to decrease inventories during these periods, for example, uh, the silicon suppliers may find they don't get any orders at all for a while. It's the nature of this kind of a industry where uh, we each depend on somebody further back in the line. The poor guy at the end of the 
chain gets really whipped during these recessions. Uh, you try to do something to make it at least so nobody dies during the period that the companies are there when you need them to come back. But it, it's pretty traumatic for everybody. Now, did these cycles exist going back, like the Fairchild days, for example? It was the same yeah, thing. Yeah, these cycles have existed about as long as the industry has. Uh, I remember them in the early 60s. Uh, we weren't doing an awful lot of business back in the 50s, but uh, they, they come, uh, no two of them are exactly alike, but uh, the one characteristic they seem to share is a price collapse. Yeah, okay. So, Gordon, did you often visit the Semicon shows, and if you did, you know, were they, was that useful having all that under the, under the one roof? Yeah. I didn't often visit them. I, I did certainly a few times. Uh, again, I was getting farther away from making the decisions on this kind of stuff, so it, it wasn't so important that I looked at the equipment. Uh, certainly Intel had large gangs of people crawling all over the shows and uh, looking at all the equipment that was coming out. It was very important that uh, we kept track of what the industry was going to supply us with. Okay. All right. Um, okay, well, we'll just move to the, uh, the museum sound bites. Uh, but just, you know, talking about Moore's Law, um, how, how speculative were your early predictions that later became known as Moore's Law? Uh, the original paper, that, which Moore's Law got its name, uh, made a prediction for 10 years that the most complex integrated circuits would go from about 60 components to something like 60,000, a thousand-fold increase in complexity. That was a wild extrapolation of very little data. I was just trying to get across the idea that integrated circuits were going to be the route to cheap electronics, something that was not clear at the time. And amazingly enough, that 10 doublings in complexity that I predicted turned out to be nine doublings, actually. Pretty close, uh, much closer than it had any uh, basis uh, to be. But uh, it got the name Moore's Law, which has stuck to everything that changes exponentially ever since. Okay. All right. Um, okay, the, uh, the next one I've got here. To what extent was it apparent to you that this almost infinite doubling was physically possible or put another way, when did you become aware of the durability <laughs> of the law? The first prediction for 10 years was all I was willing to state. Uh, in 1975, I redid it, changed the slope, and uh, again expected you know, a decade or so to be all we were looking at. And in fact, We've stayed on that amazingly closely ever since. In fact, if anything, we've done better than my revised prediction in 75. Uh, but someday all exponentials on physical quantities predict a disaster. And we're getting pretty close to molecular dimensions in the devices we're making now. And that's going to become a fundamental limit in how we can continue to shrink things. So it's going to change. Uh, after another two or three process generations, I don't know exactly when. Okay. Um, I don't know whether this is a, this is a repetitive one, but uh, they've got down here. Were you surprised by the success or the accuracy of, of your early predictions? Uh, I was surprised. Uh, there was no reason, really, uh, to believe uh, quantitatively that I was going to be that close. Uh, it, now we're at the point where uh, people in the industry recognize they have to move that fast or they fall behind. It's a funny industry. Uh, the next generation of technology gives you performance improvements, reliability improvements, and cost improvements simultaneously. If you fall behind the leading edge on the kind of products that need it, you fall behind on all fronts, so it's very important for participants to stay on that leading edge. Okay. Uh, in that similar vein, uh, how extraordinary do you think 
semiconductor price, price performance is compared with other technologies and is it accidental or a forced outcome as a result of this investment to keep up? The price performance improvements applied by the semiconductor industry have driven most of modern electronics. Uh, you can look at other places where you get the same kind of thing. For example, disk storage, which is nicely complementary to the semiconductor devices. But uh, over a long period of time, it's hard to see any technology that has remotely given the same kind of cost reduction. The only one that I can point to perhaps is printing, where the, the first uh, Gutenberg press kinds of letters must have cost the, the equivalent of a few dollars a character. And now you get uh, the New York Times on Sunday with uh, lots of characters for a few dollars. But the semiconductor industry has made bigger changes in a few decades than printing has over a few centuries. It's a marvelous technology where uh, the characteristics are driven by the physics uh, of the devices. You know the old statement that if the auto industry had Preserve, had improved at this rate, you'd be getting a million miles a gallon and so forth today. Somebody once pointed out to me from the audience, but yeah, the car would only be two inches long and a half an inch high, and not very good for your morning commute. Okay. Uh, all right, well, uh, okay, the next topic, integrated circuit. Um, uh, again, when I talked to Jay, Jay last, he's, he recalled that most people at Fairchild at the time viewed the IC as a research curiosity. When did it become apparent to you that it was going to be something big? Uh, his most people must address a different population than mine. I don't think we considered it a research curiosity. We considered it uh, a product. And uh, uh, when we did the first integrated circuits, and move them on into engineering and production. I remember assembling a group in the laboratory and saying, okay, we've done integrated circuits, now what do we do next? We started looking at other physical phenomena and the like. But we still had work going on in integrated circuits. At that time, I don't think I had the vision to see how far uh, this could go. But it was only a couple of years after that that I published the Moore law, Moore's Law paper. So uh, we were beginning to appreciate that this could be a, a really a, a major change in the, particularly the cost, but in the nature of the electronics industry. Okay. Now, were there any early applications of the IC that surprised you? Uh, the early ICs were expensive and could only go in applications where uh, weight or volume was extremely important. These tend to be military, uh, NASA, aerospace applications in general. So the early applications there didn't surprise me. Now, if you change the question to early applications of the microprocessor, uh, then my answer is completely different. The first microprocessors after the calculators went to a variety of funny applications. Uh, the one that stands out in my memory was somebody automated a hen house, uh, taking advantage of the fact here was a computer you could program to, to do the things you want. Now, I don't know what you do when you automate a hen house, but I remember that that was a peculiar application. In fact, I remember board meeting, one of the uh, board members asked, uh, when we were looking at applications of the early microprocessor, when are you going to get a customer that I've heard of? <laughs> the, the people buying these were startup companies, were obscure little operations. They weren't the, the Fortune 500 that uh, you sell to today. Okay. Uh, the next question kind of touches on what, what you just said. But uh, So at Fairchild, did you di design ICs that would have wide appeal or applicability, or they were designed for a very na narrow purpose like Defense or, or NASA no. or whatever. No, the the integrated circuits we designed at Fairchild uh, initially were general purpose logic circuits we expected people to use to build computers and computer like systems. Uh, then we started doing linear circuits uh, that were fairly broadly applicable. Uh, 
It was only when we got specifically into a major program like Minuteman 2 that the circuits were designed very specifically for a particular application. But that was a one program. Uh, we were still doing the general purpose processors, uh, general purpose circuits uh, with most of our development capability. Okay. Um, here, uh, just uh, two more questions. Uh, this is a what if. Uh, had there been a better theoretical understanding, could the technology have skipped over vacuum tubes completely um, and moved directly from the early solid-state research of the 1930s to transistors? Sure. Uh, if, if vacuum tubes hadn't been invented and the transistor had been, uh, that would be a completely acceptable path for most of the things we want to do. Uh, there are still places where vacuum tubes do things that uh, we can't do with solid state. These tend to be high power, some very high frequency applications. But uh, otherwise, uh, if electronics had grown up around the transistor rather than initially around the vacuum tube, uh, it probably would have been simpler in a lot of respects. It's just that uh, getting the first solid state device, it could be an amplifier, it took a lot longer than people expected. It took a lot more material science. Uh, the actual idea of an MOS transistor was patented in the mid-20s. Uh, you just couldn't make it practically at that time. Okay. All right, and just, just one last question, uh, something completely different. Did you have any idols or heroes when you were growing up? You know, not especially that I recall. Uh, I had a couple of teachers in high school I was quite fond of who uh, I thought uh, were very good, attended a, particularly my math teacher, who I, I thought uh, gave me a, you know, a good start there. Uh, I guess... Uh, I can't really point to anyone in particular that I say, oh, well, you know, somebody I really want to emulate. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Thank you very much, okay. Brian.